Our culture clearly impacts our language use, particularly when cultural systems of power overlap with language. Power and language go hand in hand. How do systems of power intersect with language and communication? As a first example, we have the man. The word man refers, of course, to an adult male human being, a man or boy who shows the qualities such as strength and courage that men are traditionally supposed to have, or a husband or boyfriend. It might also refer to the human race as in humankind, bipedal primate mammal, or fellow or chap. But there are other meanings, such as workforce, as in manpower, an adult male servant, as in manservant, or even an alumnus of a college or university, as in Harvard man. Finally, it might be an exclamation to indicate intensity of feeling or surprise. Man, what a day! But what do hip-hop artists mean when they refer to the man in a song? In this context, it might refer to the police, or also to the white establishment or white society. Here, the man points to the overlap between power and language. Language use by different genders can also be quite different and caught up in symbols of power. Gendered communication strategies are drawn into the dynamics of cultural power. Deborah Tannen asserted that men and women use language differently. Men compete for status, strive for independence, solve problems, convey information and give orders, while women seek support, strive for intimacy, build relationships, convey feelings, and offer suggestions. Women used women's language more than men. This speech style had to do with powerlessness rather than gender. As Tannen put it, the tendency for more women to speak powerless language is due, at least in part, to the greater tendency of women to occupy relatively powerless social positions. Presumably, as women rose to position, positions of social power, they would speak less of stereotypical women's language. Differences in how American men and women communicate has fostered a cottage industry of advice books to help us understand how the opposite sex communicates. Language dialects represent another point of intersection between power and language. A dialect is defined as a non-standard variation of language. By definition, then, in order to have a language, you must have a standard version of a language. We live in a world where language has become heavily standardized. Spelling, pronunciation, and grammar have been codified into dictionaries and grammar manuals. Spelling and grammar were not nearly as standardized in the past. The existence of a standardized version of a language is a statement of power. A group of people within a language community has been able to prevail and impose their form of pronunciation, their form of grammar, and so on. While ideologies about what counts as standard English exist, numerous dialects continue to exist in the United States. The use of these dialects is often caught up in power struggles. Side by side with the existence of a class structure, there are differences in the ways language is used among classes. We give the name standard or unaccented to the variety spoken by the most socially powerful, most educated members of society. In fact, it is rare for a person of high status to make use of a recognized dialect. But what of powerful New Yorkers, such as Michael Bloomberg or Donald Trump, or Bostonians, 
such as John Kerry or the Kennedys. President Bill Clinton, originally from Arkansas, learned to shift between standard English and his southern dialect. As his political career grew, he gradually set aside his dialect because in the larger United States, the southern dialect is often looked down upon. But whenever he returned to his home state, President Clinton's dialect shifted back to its southern roots. The mere fact that President Clinton would switch back and forth between standard English and a dialect suggests the power inherent in language. President Clinton's ability to switch dialects is an example of what is called code switching. Code switching refers to the ability to switch back and forth between different dialects, languages, or styles depending on cultural context. Code switching is very common in bilingual immigrant communities. People may speak the language of the host country in public in their native language at home. Code switching is also present in many other contexts, including academia. Populations at colleges and universities practice many ways of speak speaking. Some are appropriate in certain contexts and not in others. For example, there are certain ways that you might talk while at a party versus when you are in class. Even beyond Southern English, African American English is one of the most stigmatized dialects within the United States. Speakers of both, both speakers of standard English often project negative stereotypes about African American English, suggesting that it uses incorrect grammar and mispronounced words. But from a linguistic perspective, African American English has an internally consistent grammar, is perfectly understandable and logical, and operates as a functioning linguistic system. Some aspects of African American English may have come from dialects spoken by poor rural Southern whites, but at least some of AAVE appears to be relatively new, predominantly urban, and related to the developing oppositional identity that has developed in African American youth culture. In the 1900s, controversy arose over a rather in the 1990s controversy arose over a proposal by the Oakland School District in California to teach African American English or ebonics in the classroom the power struggle surrounding language in African American English quickly became national news in 1997 the linguistic society of america issued a statement endorsing ebonics as a systematic and rule-governed speech form rather than an inferior version of English, and commending the Oakland District for accepting it as a stepping stone to helping students master standard English. Another example of language, ethnicity, and power can be found in the use of mock Spanish within the United States. Mock Spanish is the, de the deliberate use of Spanish words incoherently for intended humorous effect. The existence of mock Spanish highlights the language struggle that we open this chapter with. The increased immigration of Mexicans and other Latin Americans into the United States has increased the amount of spoken Spanish within the nation. Many Americans are unhappy about this an attempt to keep people from speaking their native language, hence the English-only state laws we discussed earlier. As a result of laws and cultural pressure, many Spanish speakers feel compelled to restrict their use of Spanish. However, as seen in the research of Jane Hill, white English speakers do not feel the same pressures and have adopted crude or incorrect mock Spanish phrases. This is an explicit example of an ethnic majority making pejorative use of the language of a, of a minority. 
As globalization increases interaction and communication between people around the world, there is an increasing impact on languages. As people who speak different languages interact, an inevitable linguistic impact occurs. This can be seen in the untold number of loan words from one language to the next. English has borrowed, borrowed words from French, German, Spanish, and many other languages. The same is true in reverse. Globalization has resulted in diminishing language diversity around the world. Colonialism spread English, Spanish, Portuguese, French, Dutch, German, and Russian. Due to the ongoing economic and political power wielded by the Western world, Western languages have begun to supplant other languages. Today, just eight languages are spoken by more than 40% of the world's population. The top 84 languages account for 80% of humanity. And the 4,000 least widely used languages account for only 0.12% of the population. In addition to decreasing diversity in languages being spoken worldwide, we're also seeing a greater number of languages disappearing forever. When a language dies, we lose a whole worldview, if not a completely novel way of thinking. Linguistic anthropologists predict that as many as half the world's approximately 7,000 languages could be lost by the end of the 21st century. Currently, 469 languages have fewer than 100 speakers. At the same time, anthropologists, linguists, and native speakers are working to revitalize languages. Daryl Baldwin directs the Miami Center at Miami University and has sought to revitalize the Miami language and culture. Through the extraordinary efforts of Baldwin, Miami Cultural Resources Officer Julie Olds, linguist David Costa, and others, the Miami language, which had lost its last native speaker in the mid-20th century, has been revived. The digital revolution of the past 35 years has had an unprecedented effect on the ability of people to communicate. This change has been further transformed by the social media revolution of the past 10 years. If you have a smartphone in your pocket, you can communicate with people across the globe instantly in numerous ways by calling, texting, sending emails, pictures, or videos. These digital technologies have made communication simpler and in some cases have radically changed lives. They're also changing the ways we use words. While most Americans confidently speak English and some even fret about the future of an American society and identity premised on English, the United States has always been and will continue to be a multilingual society. As composite systems, languages are open, and open to borrowing from each other. English itself is a language that evolved and continues to evolve by absorbing various linguistic influences. There are great variations within English. These include language variations in relation to other social variables such as class, race, ethnicity, region, and gender. Finally, language may serve as a marker of, of social, a social marker rather, of unequal power relations and status within the larger English-speaking community.